It was declared illegal 15 years ago, but Israel's separation wall still stands and continues to affect the lives of Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. Israel argues it's protecting its security, but at what cost to peace? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the programme. I'm Hala Mahiedin. Fifteen years ago, the International Court of Justice ruled against Israel's separation wall. It said the state cannot use the right of self-defence to build and maintain the barrier. For Palestinians, it's a symbol of military occupation and an attempt by Israel to grab more land. Once completed, the wall will stretch through the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem at a length of over 700 kilometres. It's affected the lives of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians and the number of illegal Israeli settlements has gone up in the meantime. We'll bring in our guests in just a moment, but first Nida Ibrahim sets up our discussion from Bir Nabala. The town of Bir Nabala, northeast of Jerusalem, has been living in the shadow for 15 years. Its economy was booming in the 1990s when the town linked Jerusalem to many cities in the occupied West Bank. It looks more like a ghost town now. Since the Israeli government ordered the building of the separation wall in 2002, the wall has blocked the town's main road, limiting access to people and products. Hundreds of shops have closed their doors and thousands of townspeople have left. Carpenter Medhat Karaja is one of a few who decided to keep his business open. But it's very different to when he rented the workshop in the year 2000 and employed nine workers. Now the only carpenters there are him and his partner. Like the town's economy, their business has been cut right back. This is one of the most vivid areas in Bir Nabala. We're a few meters away from an Israeli industrial area. This area was bustling with businesses and people going back and forth. Now, we rely on a few customers. The contrast between the two sides of the wall can be seen vividly here and also heard. On the Israeli side, there is the loud noise of construction works. On the Palestinian side, dead silence. As Palestinians are being pushed out on their side of the wall because of land confiscation, more Israelis are taking advantage, such as at the Sha'ari Tikva settlement in the north of the occupied West Bank. An Israeli military order confiscated Palestinian land there for building the wall. Israelis built a stable on it. Palestinian fears have increased since Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced plans to annex parts of the West Bank. The main goal in the Israeli agenda is to grab more lands, push more people out, especially those living in East Jerusalem. The wall helps Israel build more settlements, extend the existing ones and consolidate them in the Palestinian territory. Around 65% of the Israeli separation wall is complete. The rest is under construction and when it's finished, is expected to take up to 10% of all land in the occupied West Bank. Many Palestinians say the main purpose of Israel's policy is to make life so unbearable they have no option but to leave. Nida Ibrahim, Al Jazeera, the occupied West Bank. Well, let's bring in our panel. In Ramallah, we have Amar Hijazi, Assistant Minister for Multilateral Affairs at the Palestinian Foreign Ministry. In West Jerusalem, we have Avi Bell, a senior fellow at the Kohelet Policy Forum and a professor of law at Bar Ilan University. And in Beirut, we're joined by Diala Shahadi, uh, president rather of the Center for Defending Civil Rights and Liberties and a former outreach officer for the Arab region at the International Criminal Court. So I'd like to extend a welcome to all three of you to start this discussion. Um, this comes, of course, on the, the 15th anniversary of that just uh, judgment from the ICJ. Um, if I could start with you, Diala Shahadi, what has changed effectively since that judgment? was passed more violations of course of international law and international humanitarian law has been committed in the Palestinian territories by the Israeli government more persistent of the veto holders on uh, backing these violations by blocking any efforts to issue sanctions against Israel for 
violating over 30 resolutions of condemnation and criticism for its policies within the Palestinian territories. It's clear that international justice cannot be achieved by simply establishing international judicial, judicial systems and entities. Political will is a necessity in the veto system. OK, um, if I could come to you now, Avi Bell, uh, what would you say this uh, has changed in the 15 years since that judgment? Well, unfortunately, very little. I think that the, what the judgment was was an opportunity for the court to reject political interpretations of international law and give a professional legal opinion, particularly on the illegality of Palestinian terrorism. Instead, what the court did was it gave a free pass to Palestinian terrorists and announced that Israel had no legal right to defend its citizens from being murdered, which is a preposterous conclusion. Unfortunately, we're still seeing a, uh, an ICJ that is politicized and Palestinian terrorists con continue to enjoy impunity from international law. Um, Amar Hijazi, would you agree with that? I'm guessing you won't. Uh, certainly we don't. Uh, well, uh, terrorism is certainly what we see on a daily basis in our streets by the settlers, illegal settlers and uh, a colonial army that occupies us and has been denying us our rights for so long. Uh, this is the real terrorism that our people live in and out every day. But in relation to your earlier question and in relation to the international court, we think that the uh, legal, most uh, prestigious and important legal body in the world has uh, defied all the lies that Israel has been spreading for the international community about security and about its right to defend itself and came forth and said that what Israel is doing is basically a land grab and more land theft from the Palestinians and it has to bring an end this this kind of practice. Yes, the wall opinion has not formulated yet in a position whereby Israel is being held accountable for its violations, but it will come the time where this uh, uh, very important advisory opinion will be implemented. Uh, but Palestine has uh, moved uh, in so many fronts uh, legally uh, in relation to that opinion, but uh, still the international will is absent and holding Israel accountable at so many violations that it has been committing against our people is still uh, a long path to, to walk, but we will be walking that path and we will see all criminals before international courts being held accountable, hopefully very soon. If I could, if I could come in on that point, though, where there, there seems to be a, a disconnect, really, between whether this is a judgment that is a political judgment or a legal judgment. And if there is so much faith being placed in the legal system, who would uphold and who would implement this? Amar Hijazi. Yes, I mean, the court was very clear uh, when it came to this judgment. The court has put the ounce on the occupying power, the colonial uh, Israeli regime, to implement its duties by uh, ending uh, the, the, the uh, building of the wall, by compensating and reparating, uh, uh, making reparation for the Palestinians for the uh, uh, damages that has been resulted from the building of this wall and to end all its illegal practices in the occupied Palestinian territory. The court also said and reminded the world, including Israeli occupation, that the Palestinians' right to self-determination is an erga omnis right in which all states has a vested interest in implementing. The court further uh, called upon the international community not to recognize Israel's illegal practices and ask them and this actually happened. Nobody recognizes any legitimacy of any land grab or any attempt to annex any Palestinian land by Israel, including its illegal colonial settlement regime. Uh, the world but also again, requested I, I'm the sorry Security to cut you Council off. and the General Assembly. Uh, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, but it, you know these, these judgments are no. passed down, these resolutions are passed, but they are not being implemented. So my, my blunt question again is, what is the point of relying on these uh, judgments if there is if there is no one to if there is no one to enforce uh, these judgments? I mean, it depends on what kind of world you wish or we wish to live in. These judgments have exactly the pronunciation of what the law delineates in, in terms of rights and obligations. 
And it doesn't mean the absence of application on the ground, which we see now because of the absence of any kind of accountability to the occupying power, uh, is not being implemented. It does not mean that this gives Israel any ounce of right in the occupied Palestinian territory. At the same level, it does not deny the Palestinians their right. Now, when it comes to application, it requires, as has been said by your first guest, it requires international will. And I think the international will is being built towards that end, with the exception of, of course, the current U.S. administration. But we are seeing so many movements around the world, which is holding Israel accountable at so many levels. And the basis upon which this, the Israeli uh, uh, colonial regime is being held accountable is the uh, ICJ advisory opinion, international law, and the basis of international human rights and international humanitarian law. OK, Avi Bell, I'll, let you, I'll give you a chance to respond to that now. Well, very briefly, there, there's a, a gap here, but it's not between um, Israeli behavior and international law. It's between the rhetoric of international law and the reality of it. The reality is this, that the Palestinians can say up is down and, and down is up, and the General Assembly will vote yes, and the ICJ will say yes, and there are uh, a large group of international institutions that no matter what bizarre claim the Palestinians make, such as that they're allowed to murder Israeli civilians with impunity. And is that, that a they claim have, they uh, make, though, to be they, fair, Avi Bell? That is most certainly a claim that is being made. That is a claim that, hit, that uh, was just made right now. And that uh, when he said that there is no terrorism that is being carried out by uh, the Palestinians. By the way, just a, a day after a Jerusalem district court held the Palestinian Authority for uh, terrorist attacks that murdered hundreds of Israeli civilians in the years before that barrier was, uh, was created. So as long as the Palestinians keep trying to turn upside down international law and disobeying it, they're not going to get any results. Israel has the, uh, uh, there's a very strong political current in Israel to obey international law. But when there are international institutions that use international rhetoric, uh, international law rhetoric in an upside down fashion, which they pronounced down up and up down, there's less and less respect, not only in Israel, but around the world for these international institutions. There's less respect for international law, and there's certainly much less chance of reconciliation. Instead of telling themselves, instead of Palestinians tell, telling themselves that they have the right to do anything that they want to do, that they can murder anyone that they want, they can claim anything that they want. And if instead they start actually listening to what international law requires and start thinking that if these are really rules they have to apply universally, then we might get somewhere. But the, the international law as it stands uh, says that you cannot, you, you, it doesn't say you cannot build a barrier, uh, but you cannot build a barrier on occupied lands. Would you, uh, would you agree with that? No, there is no such international rule. And there's a reason that the court deliberately avoided giving any of its statements in general rules that apply elsewhere. So when it said, for example, that Israel has no right to defend itself against Palestinian terrorism, it didn't claim that it could apply this uh, rule universally. And in fact, there's no other place in the world since the opinion where anyone has used that uh, judicial opinion to say, oh, a country does not have a general right to protect itself against terrorism, nor, frankly, has there been any case where um, uh, a court has ruled that a country does not have a right to protect itself against terrorism by building a barrier. None of these are universal rules. All of them are rules that were specifically made up in distortion of international law against Israel. And that's why you don't see them being applied anywhere else. Diala Shahadi in Beirut, why is it that Israel cannot build a wall to defend itself under international law? Well, the, the decision of the ICG was very clear, clear on this matter. They said that Israel could not rely on a right of self-defense, whether against so-called terrorism or any acts of aggression, uh, to justify the barrier, not only because the barrier is built on um, occupied territories, but also because uh, the barrier violated the international law when, by violating the self-determination of the uh, Palestinian uh, people. But we've just heard the from ICJ Avi Bell that that's the not the case. I'm sorry. We've just heard from Avi Bell that that's not the case. There is, there is no precedence, um, according to Avi Bell in West Jerusalem, uh, for not being able to build on occupied land. Well, the comparison, no, it, it, it is a precedent to build a barrier on occupied territories. The precedent is in 
Palestine and the occupied Palestine. When we compare this apartheid wall with our other countries, the main difference is that it's being built on non-sovereign territories of the state that has built it. Actually, uh, one of the, uh, is the very interesting uh, um, recommendations on how to execute this decision was reflected by uh, one of the pro-Palestinian cause, Norman Falkenstein, who called for uh, the mass civilians in Palestine to go and cheer down the walls by themselves, because this would only produce crimes against humanity if the Israeli government was to block such an action. We haven't seen this, unfortunately. I, I hope this could happen one day, maybe in the next generation. OK, Avi Bell, you were trying to come in there. What was it you were trying to respond to? Well, I was simply trying to give an example of, um, of barriers built in occupied territories and non-sovereign territories. Morocco has a, has a barrier in Western Sahara which it has been illegally occupying since 1974. There are barriers in other uh, disputed and occupied territories throughout the world, including in uh, Cyprus and in Armenia um, and elsewhere. The, the only way to sustain the claim that Israel is violating international law here is by pretending that there is no other law anywhere else in the world, that everywhere else has an entirely different rule, and that there's one rule that applies to the Jewish state and another rule that applies to everyone else in the world. Now, that, frankly, is not law. That's politics. Um, Amar Hijazi, what would you say to that, that this isn't a legal issue, this is a political one? Well, if you take the... Uh... Uh, same rhetoric that has been used by all war criminals and those who commit violations of international law, it's almost exactly the same what we heard just now from your guest from Israel. The reality is that the court has looked at the whole situation, the context of the situation, and what Israel, the occupying power, the colonial occupying power in Palestine, has been doing all along. And it found out that Israel has had the appetite of annexing parts of the occupied Palestinian territory, including as relating to East Jerusalem. And this is why the court has specifically said, including in East Jerusalem, the wall building is illegal. The court has found that the route of the wall is meant to encompass this appetite, which is meant to uh, annex and, and steal and, and put its hand on more Palestinian land. So the colonial uh, attempt by Israel to grab Palestinian land is what has been very obvious before the court. Yes, there has been cases where other walls has been built, and there has been cases where others has transgressed on others' land, and the court has specifically said that no one has the right to do something that is beyond uh, legal domination, its legal domination to uh, do such practices. And Israel is doing exactly that. And this is why the court, in line with international humanitarian law, in line with international law, in line with international practice, and in line with so many other uh, precedents in international law, has made that determination. Crying wolf and uh, uh, saying that uh, Israel is, is the only one targeted by this is uh, a game that Israel always tries to, to play in relation to international law. Israel refuses to implement or respect any code of norm that the civilized nations live by. Israel is the, the most violator of more, okay. the, the, the largest number of international resolutions, right. international norms, including international uh, human rights law, which the court asked Israel to implement. Why does the occupation deny the Palestinian people their rights, their human, their basic human rights? And that's a question that Israel should be asked. Why does Israel move its own population into occupied territory and tries to grab the land and annex East Jerusalem? Okay, All of let, these me, let me. Let me. I'm, I'm sorry security. to cut you off, Amr Hajazi. We are running short on time. Avi yes, Bell, please. if I could raise yeah. that point with you. We heard there the suggestion that it's not security uh, which is the, the, the raison d'etre for this wall, it's annexation of occupied lands. How would you respond to that? Well, there's some very simple statistics on this. In the years before the barrier was created, roughly in the four years beforehand, Palestinian terrorists murdered roughly 1,000 Israeli civilians in hundreds of different attacks, 
All those attacks were violations of international law. Not only were they violations of the laws of war, they were crimes against humanity. And according to the Special Tribunal uh, 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 from Lebanon, they also violated an international customary crime against uh, uh, terrorism. And since the barrier has been constructed, the number of successful Palestinian terrorist attacks is down drastically. There is nowhere near the number that there were beforehand. So it's very clearly effective as a security measure. Now, it's true that uh, Palestinian uh, critics like to imagine all sorts of parades of horribles about future plans of things, horrible things that Israel intends to do. Uh, these future terrible things that Israel intends to do don't seem to ever materialize. And I think that's maybe because they are only in their heads. But it, it, if it is in people's heads, the fact that this wall has been built not on the, uh, the, 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 the green dividing line from the, uh, the, the 1967 uh, borders, but it is, in fact, encroaching uh, well into land that should be under Palestinian jurisdiction. Uh, where's the justification for, for, for shifting and looping the barriers around settlements and strategic areas of the West Bank? Well, as you know, Israel didn't construct the barrier for political reasons. It did so for security reasons, and it has a security route rather than a political, uh, geopolitical route. That said, I have to say, there's also a longstanding dispute between the Palestinians and Israelis, which all of your viewers, I'm sure, know, about the standing of the 1949 to 1967 armistice lines. Are they, in fact, borders, as the Palestinians selectively either claim yes or no, depending on where they are, or are they simply ceasefire lines, as Israel claims? Now, one, so one of the interesting things is that in the, the Palestinians have since filed a, another claim with the ICJ just in the last year, in which they've claimed that the 1946, 1949 armistice lines do not constitute a boundary, which is why, according to their claim, the none of Jerusalem uh, can be claimed as part of Israel. It's okay. inconsistent, but one of the things about making a, a Palestinian claims on behalf of the Palestinian Authority, legal claims on behalf of the Palestinian Authority, is that you don't have to be consistent. OK, we, we're, we're down to the final minutes of this discussion. I want to put the same question to all three of you. Um, we're, we're at this point, there, uh, much is disputed when it comes to this wall, uh, not least the legal definitions of what validates a, a, a valid claim. but. I want to know what the end point is. Where do you see this going? What do you see as the end point for this discussion? Does the wall stay up and remain, and territory remains on these uh, on these boundaries, or, or is there, or, or do you see this moving somewhere else? And if you could keep your answers fairly brief, please. Uh, let me stand with you. Uh, start with you, Diala Shahadi. Obviously, only a political will will be. Uh, the mean to execute judicial de decisions. We've seen this at the level of the International Criminal Court, where even state parties to the ICC did not comply with decisions uh, issued by, the, by, by this court, such as the warrant of arrest for the Sudanese um, previously president of, uh, of um, Omar al-Bashir. So in the absence of political will of the major players at the level of the Security Council, no international justice could be really achieved. So hopefully this could be uh, more willingly discussed through a political uh, peace process agreement in the future. OK, if I could turn to you now, Amar Hajazi, what's the end point with this? Do you see international law being uh, implemented at some stage? Yes, we do, and we think that uh, the twisted logic and the uh, bent uh, justification that Israel tries to sell to the world is coming to an end. Uh, its uh, colonial enterprise is very obvious. One, it does not uh, have any interest in peace. It has uh, enjoyed impunity forever, and this will come to the end of the line when the international community and the whole world will find that this is a threat to international peace and security and will start dealing with it as such. When Israel is held accountable, just like any other state around the world, then we think this uh, is, is the way forward. Okay. Otherwise, uh, continuing to, to justify its okay. illegal practices by hiding behind 
uh, certain aspects uh, is, is, is not going to sell anymore. And Amar Hajazi, I'm afraid with that we have run out of time. I'd like to thank all three of my guests for taking part in this discussion. Amar Hajazi, Avi Bell and Diala Shahadi. Thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting the website aljazeera.com. The discussion continues online. To take part, head to our Facebook page at forward slash AJ Inside Story or join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story or tweet me directly at Halamahyuddin. From me and the entire team here in Doha, it's bye for now.